Um, in any case, my presentation this afternoon is titled uh, Caribbean Plantation Economies as Colonial Models, uh, circa 1650 to 1690. Um, and it combines some of my, uh, the work from my master's research uh, project in 2016 on the English East India Company and slavery in the 17th century with my more recent PhD work uh, on 17th century Barbados. Uh, and in keeping with the conference theme of global and comparative perspectives, what I hope is that my paper will show how the Barbadian plantation economy, uh, a key site for the production of new intoxicants such as sugar and tobacco using violent labor management techniques, proved to be so profitable for merchants and plantation owners that it had a powerful influence on how the English thought about colonization and labor uh, elsewhere in the globe, uh, even in places as far distant from the Caribbean as Sumatra in Southeast Asia. First, it's important to provide a bit of a brief background on the economic development of Barbados. Um, Barbados was colonized by the English in 1627 uh, and looking to emulate the success of plantation owners in Virginia and St. Kitts planters in Barbados started out cultivating tobacco using the labor of white indentured servants before also experimenting with other cash crops such as ginger, cotton and indigo during the 1630s. According to the most recent historian of Barbados, um, Russell Maynard, Barbadian planters enjoyed a period of comfortable if crude prosperity in these years and this economic dynamism carried over into the 1640s when the colony underwent a diversified export boom. Now, the advent of a commercial sugar industry in Barbados in the years 1641 to 43 was stimulated by the spike in sugar prices caused by the recent collapse of the Brazilian sugar industry uh, and catapulted Barbados to a position of commercial preeminence in the Atlantic world. A plantation complex based around sugar production and African slavery emerged rapidly in Barbados during the 1640s, principally due to an influx of capital investment provided by uh, London merchants and expertise from Sephardic refugees who were fleeing warfare in northern Brazil. By 1650, commodity transactions suggest that sugar uh, was the leading cash crop exported by Barbadians, and by the 1670s, Barbados was by far the wealthiest and most important colony in the English Empire, due to its function both as a burgeoning center of plantation production and also a pivot point in Atlantic trade where hundreds of merchant vessels docked each year. Now, it's important to emphasize that the sugar slavery plantation complex uh, was not pioneered in mid 17th century Barbados, but had been in development for centuries beforehand. Sugar cultivation and the plantation system were transferred from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic islands, uh, to Brazil, and eventually to the Caribbean between the 12th and 17th centuries. And the link between the use of enslaved African labor and sugar production has first been made by the Portuguese in the Atlantic islands of Madeira and Sao Tome during the 15th century and then exported to Brazil. From a global perspective then, the Barbados sugar boom or sugar revolution was merely one brief step in the long evolutionary process of the development of the sugar slavery plantation complex. Nonetheless, what happened in Barbados was of vital importance for the future development of the English empire. The commercial success of plantation production had been demonstrated to the English by the tobacco boom in Virginia in the 1610s and 1620s. But the key lesson taken by the English from their experiences in Barbados during the 1640s and 1650s were the benefits in inverted commas of substituting white indentured labor for enslaved African labor, and how deploying enslaved Africans in large numbers to produce cash crops in the plantation economy could lead to very significant private profits and customs revenue for the state. Now, of course, Barbados wasn't the first place where the English had enslaved Africans. Scholars such as Michael Glasgow have shown how English explorers and privateers have become familiar with the Iberian practice of enslaving Africans during the 16th century. And after the 1610s, Englishmen had exploited the labor of small numbers of enslaved Africans in agricultural and urban settings in Virginia, Bermuda, and Providence Islands. The English had also observed the Iberian powers and the Dutch deploying large numbers of enslaved Africans on commercial plantations on the Atlantic islands, Brazil, and Guyana. The English in Barbados were thus not innovators, uh, but imitators. However, until Barbados, the English had never before had any practical hands-on experience of deploying enslaved Africans on plantations on such a large scale, with hundreds of enslaved people working on a single plantation unit. In 1654, the Jesuit priest Antoine Biet exclaimed how it was, quote, quite a sight to see 200 slaves working with sugar at the Drax Hall plantation in Barbados. In 1669, Robert Hooper owned a 350-acre plantation in Barbados with a workforce of 150 enslaved Africans. 
and a year later in 1670, Richard Batson's 360 acre estate was operating with a workforce of 157 enslaved Africans. And this was unlike anything seen to date in the English speaking world. And it was this direct and first hand experience with exploiting large numbers of enslaved African laborers on commercial plantations in Barbados that crystallized new ideas about labor and colonization in the minds of Englishmen. And these ideas would be formative, I argue, for future English expansion in the Americas and other parts of the globe as well. So what had the English learned from their experiences in mid-century Barbados? One of the ideas that found coherent expression in Barbados was that enslaved Africans were the key to plantation labor in parts of the world with a tropical climate and were superior to white laborers. The English developed a belief, which we now of course know to be erroneous, that unlike white laborers, African bodies were uniquely adapted to intense agricultural labor and tropical climates. As early as 1645, George Downing wrote from Barbados and observed that, quote, Negroes were the life of this place. And in 1676, the governor of Barbados, Sir Jonathan Atkins, argued that, quote, three blacks work better and cheaper than one white man. The English also learned in mid-century Barbados that for a white minority to control tens of thousands of enslaved Africans, it was necessary to use exceedingly violent and degrading labor management techniques to terrorize an enslaved majority. And we see this codified in the 1661 Barbados slave laws titled, and I quote, an act for the better ordering and governing of Negroes. But as I've already mentioned, the key lesson that the English took from their experiences in Barbados was that the use of enslaved African labor in the plantation economy could lead to huge private profits. A link between plantation production, the deployment of large numbers of enslaved Africans and commercial profit had become firmly rooted in the minds of English merchants, planters, officials and colonial theorists by um, at the latest, the 1670s and 1680s. Now it's well known to historians of early America that a Barbadian diaspora took ideas, legal codes and institutions from Barbados to elsewhere in the greater Caribbean region um, and the southern colonies of, uh, in North America, influencing the economic development of Suriname, Carolina and most importantly Jamaica. African slavery was thus entrenched in these societies from the very beginning of settlement. So the influence of ideas about labor and colonization forged in Barbados can be detected in a variety of other places throughout England's global empire. And it's this that's been less well studied by historians and is what the remainder of my presentation today will explore. So one of the earliest examples of Caribbean plantation economy serving as a colonial model for those involved in eastward expansion dates to the late 1640s, when English efforts were underway to colonize Madagascar in the Southwest Indian Ocean. There have been intermittent attempts, uh, English attempts to settle Madagascar since the 1630s. But by the late 1640s, um, efforts were concentrated on Asada, which is an island now called Novi B, just off the coast of northern Madagascar. Now attempts to, to colonize Asada quickly failed due to epidemic disease and violent conflict with local Malagasy people. But promotional literature commissioned to attract planters to settle in the colony is revealing about how the English were thinking about colonization and labor in the late 1640s and 1650s. As historians such as Alton Gaines and Edmund Smith have observed, English merchants and colonial projectors envisioned Asada functioning as both a site of plantation production and the, uh, the nexus of a global trade with Africa, Asia and the Americas. Robert Hunt's pamphlet, The Island of Asada, published in 1650, drew uh, explicit connections between Barbados and Asada. He argued that because both islands lay between the tropics uh, at 13 degrees latitude and were of similar size, English settlers would be able to use the salubrious climate to, to cultivate a variety of profitable commodities from both the Caribbean and the East Indies, such as sugarcane, indigo, cotton, tobacco, ginger, pepper and rice, um, some of which are, of course, uh, new intoxicants. The fact that a Barbados, rather than another English plantation colony such as Virginia, uh, was uh, served as a colonial model for Hon, highlights, I think, how the commercial success of Barbados was already shaping the way that the English thought about colonization, even as early as 1650, when the sugar boom and the rise of African slavery on the island was still in its early stages. As in Barbados, Hunt conjectured that indentured servants and enslaved African workforce would provide the labor necessary for plantation agriculture and the 200 sugar mills uh, he hoped would soon operate in Asada. While Hunt thought that the cost to transport and provision 20 English servants would cost 300 pounds of both Barbados and Asada, 
He also projected that the proximity of Asada to slave trading markets on the African coast guaranteed that enslaved Africans would be inexpensive for the projected colony. The relative cost of labor is thus a key feature of Hunt's pamphlet. The vast distances and risks involved with transporting enslaved Africans across the Atlantic to the English Caribbean meant that, according to Hunt, 100 Negroes cost planters on Barbados 2,700 pounds, while at Asada, the same number of enslaved laborers would only cost 100 pounds. So for Hunt then, an enslaved African workforce was thus a superior form of labor to cultivate commodities such as sugar uh, in the plantation economy at Asada, principally because it was more cost effective. Um, so in the early 1680s, um, zooming forward a bit in time, uh, the English East India Company became interested in fostering the development of a plantation economy at the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, which was colonized by the company in 1659 for use as a resupply station on the return voyage from Asia. The company thought that because St. Helena is situated between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, uh, that they'd be able to develop a plantation economy based around sugar production there. However, um, as, as you might expect, their efforts quickly failed due to the island's mountainous geography, poor soil, and the fact that St. Helena does not, in fact, uh, possess a tropical climate due to the cooling influence of the Benguela current. But despite the East India Company's failure, their plans for the St. Helena project in the 1680s do provide really interesting insights into how Barbados was influencing how the English thought about labor and colonization on a global scale. For example, the extent to which Barbados had thoroughly racialized the way that the English thought about labor is evidenced by how the directors of the East India Company regularly stated in the correspondence that they knew from experience that successful English plantations, and I quote, cannot be affected without slaves. They argued that it was, quote, utterly impossible for any Europe plantation to thrive between the tropics without the assistance and labor of Negroes. And a scarcity of enslaved Africans in St. Helena was believed to be the principal reason why, and I quote again, the planters on that island had not yet found the way to produce any useful or profitable commodity. So the link between the labor of enslaved Africans, plantation production and commercial profit, which had been firmly demonstrated to the English in mid-century Barbados, explicitly informed the East India Company's plan for St. Helena. The company's directors explained that they had found by experience that it was a quote, vain thing in such foreign plantations ever to expect to be supplied with all sorts of necessary workmen from England until the black slaves had been brought up to a thorough understanding and use of all working occupations as they have done long since in Barbados. Now, if the first English planters on Barbados had not trained their enslaved Africans to work in skilled occupations, the East India Company firmly believed that they quote, could never have brought that island to what it is, being now improved to such a height that from thence to sail 500 ships yearly, small and great. The directors remained firmly confident that once St. Helena had been, quote, stocked with Negroes, every acre of arable land on the island would be worth many more per acre than the best land of England, as it is in Barbados and other places of such like production that are thoroughly settled. The East India Company's directors also advised that the violent and brutal labor management techniques developed by Caribbean planters to manage an enslaved majority should be implemented by the inhabitants of St. Helena. The East India Company was keenly aware that, quote, there are in Barbados usually 50,000 blacks to 6,000 whites, and yet they are kept in subjection without any other garrison than the planters themselves. But they also recognized that the English, quote, could not keep the knife from their throats at Barbados if they did not punish their thievish blacks with far greater severity. And as a result, the company emphasized that enslaved people deployed on plantations at St. Helena were to be managed efficiently um, under the quote, rigors of the Barbados discipline by putting quote, overseers over them as shall compel them to do a full day's work. To inform the uh, planters of St. Helena um, how an Englishman in the Caribbean extracted the maximum amount of labor from their enslaved Africans. The company sent a copy of the laws and customs of Barbados, which contained information relating to the, and I quote again, government, working, diet, times of labor, and use of their Negroes. So in the 1680s and 1690s, the English East India Company was also concerned with developing sugar and pepper plantations at its isolated settlement of Benkulan on the west coast of Sumatra. Unlike St. Helena, Barbados was not used as an explicit model in Sumatra, 
Instead, that was Batavia and Java, where the Dutch hired Chinese planters to use enslaved labor on commercial plantations, um, which form the colonial model most commonly referred to by the company's directors with regard to Sumatra. But it is nonetheless clear to see how English experiences in Barbados were still having an implicit influence on the way that the English were thinking about labor in Sumatra. The labor of local peoples was regularly uh, declared to be inadequate. For example, there are reports in 1690 that, quote, the Malays were a lazy sort of people who would not work how poor soever they are. In response, uh, the East India Company substituted Malay labor for enslaved Africans. In the 1680s and 1690s, the EIC trafficked hundreds of enslaved people from Madagascar over huge distances, spanning almost the entire breadth of the Indian Ocean to Ben Coulin, where they worked in the plantation economy and urban occupations. And the company also dispatched Nathaniel Cox, a Barbadian expert who'd previously worked as an overseer on Sir Christopher Codrington's Barbadian sugar plantation to provide planters in Sumatra with relevant expertise in how to cultivate and process sugar. Um, so in the longer article version of this paper, I also analyzed uh, English colonization schemes for West Africa and East Africa in the 17th century, but I don't have time for that here, so I'll quickly conclude in the minute or so that I have remaining. The English experience in Barbados transformed their understanding of labor and colonization. After 1650, Barbados was seen by the English as the most profitable model for colonial development and the labor of enslaved Africans was perceived by contemporaries as a vital part of this model, which underpinned the commercial su success of the island. By the 1670s and 1680s, those involved in directing and administering England's empire, plantation owners, colonial officials, London merchants, uh, colonial theorists too, had developed a, a thoroughly racialized vision of labor in places of the world with a tropical climate, and were coming to believe that African slavery could uh, be the source of both private profit uh, and national wealth. Even the English royal family subscribed to this uh, vision of empire. Um, it is of course no coincidence that the principal English slave trading company formed in 1672 was called the Royal African Company. The King, the Queen, the Queen Mother and prominent aristocrats were all leading investors in this company. Um, but evidence from the East India Company archive presented here uh, underscores, I think, how English thinking about labor in parts of the world been, with a tropical climate had been racialized through their experience in mid 17th century Barbados. In the second half of the 17th century, Barbados influenced not just the economic development of English colonies in the greater Caribbean region and the southern colonies of uh, North America, but also the East India companies thinking about how to develop profitable plantation economies in the South Atlantic and Southeast Asia based around sugar production. Um, and very quickly, what, what can this tell us more broadly? Um, first, I think that it, it shows us that it's important for historians to center the Caribbean. Uh, within the broader currents of global history um, and imperial history too. Uh, as to date, historians have been slow to firmly integrate the significant social and economic developments which occurred in the early modern Caribbean into the field of global history, but uh, that is beginning to change in recent years. And finally, it also speaks to uh, some more parochial debates in Caribbean historiography. Um, in his important 2006 monograph, Sweet Negotiations, Russell Maynard has argued that we should reevaluate the notion that events in mid 17th century Barbados were a sugar revolution due to the fact that the sugar slavery plantation complex had been in development for centuries beforehand and because crops other than sugar were also important to Barbadian economic development in the 1640s. Now, Maynard is absolutely right to say that the history of Barbados is more complex than historians had previously appreciated and we should interrogate this concept of a sugar revolution. But I do think that the evidence presented here about how experiences in Barbados racialized the way English thought about labor and that we can detect this having a clear influence on, on a global scale in the primary source record surely suggests important shifts uh, in, in mentalities and practices occurring in mid 17th century Barbados, which had revolutionary implications for the future development of the British Empire. And therefore perhaps historians shouldn't be too hasty to do away with the concept of a Barbadian sugar revolution just yet. Thanks for listening.